Good morning. Welcome to the December meeting of the Small Acreage Horticultural Crop Webinar Series. Today we have Lauren Ward from the uh, uh, Honey Bee Lab presenting uh, promoting native and honey bee pollination and vegetable crops. Lauren, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, good morning. So thank you for bearing with me through my first setting up of a webinar with very fancy bar equipment. Um, <laughs> that never goes quite as planned. But yes, I'll be talking about both native and honeybees um, and vegetable crops. I can even touch a little bit on fruit crops as well. Um, so insect pollinators. So we think about bees a lot in insect pollination. But there's actually a lot of virtue out there. Um, Bees are definitely the most advanced pollinators, but we have things like butterflies and moths. Um, this moth is a, a night bloom visiting moth on Virginia this picture. Um, moths and butterflies are great people love to see them in their adult stage, but the larval stage of a moth, very similar to this, is actually the tomato hornworm. Um, so, so usually people have a little bit of an issue with the, the immature stages of the lepidopteran pollinators like butterflies and moths. Um, also beetles, that's just this picture of this beetle chowing down here. Um, they're more primitive pollinators. They do a certain amount of pollination. Um, they tend to be more destructive, however, as you can see from these flowers. So beetles are in there. Um, beetle pollinated plants tend to be sort of these large bowl-shaped flowers like um, magnolia is, is a good example. Where you have beetle pollination, they kind of have a sickly sweet smell almost. Whereas the moths and butterflies tend to go for a lighter smell, such as the night nice bee flowers. Um, we also have a lot of pollination in gypsum. I would say uh, gypsum are probably the second most important pollinator group, um, actually, even above the lepidopter to show the flies. Um, this is a fly that's actually a little bit trying to mimic lost in bees, so it doesn't need to eat. Um, but the gypsum are pollinate, or the flies pollinate quite a few flies as well. Um, about 70% of all the angiosperms sperms of flowering plants are pollinated by insects. So that's a vast majority. The angiosperms are the most hyper-diverse, largest group of plants. Others are pollinated um, primarily by wind. Uh, so all the grasses, sedges, a lot of the common trees, like oak trees, are pollinated by wind. This does not mean that pollinators don't, or at least bees, do not collect pollen from some of these. It just means that the plant doesn't need the bees. Um, lesser groups for the rest of this small percentage, um, bats and birds. We see hummingbirds that are pollinators here in the U.S. Um, in South America, and you can show it into the neotropics and tropics, bats become a much more important uh, pollinator than elsewhere. So this evolution with flowering plants, um, insects, insect pollinators and flowering plants um, have been evolving sort of together with co-evolution for, for a very, very long time. The vast majority um, are where both parties benefit. So on the plant side, it's pollinated more efficiently. Plants don't tend to like self-pollination. Some plants can do it, some plants can't at all. Um, they have developed a lot of mechanisms by which to not pollinate themselves because outcrossing and, and genetic diversity is very important. Um, and the animal pollinator and the insect pollinator uh, receives nectar. Nectar is a sort of reward just for pollination. Um, things that don't need to be pollinated tend not to have nectar. So nectar is simply to draw in those pollinators. Um, pollen, which in the case of bees, is used as a protein source to raise the brood, um, or both. There is this kind of rare case of antagonism where um, only one party benefits. Um, in pollinators, it tends to be the plant benefits. A kind of interesting example of this is this orchid. Um, this is an orchid that mimics uh, a relative of bees, and it mim mimics the female of the species. Um, it even emits smells that smell like the female bee. Um, and so for pollination, what happens is there's no real reward to this orchid, but a male bee comes and tries to mate with it, and then it transfers pollen that way, because they'll try to mate with the next one. They don't quite learn. Um, so kind of an interesting example. But that, that's the exception rather than the rule. Like I said, really deep evolutionary times, this has been a co-evolved sort of a surface, this pollination 
and the animal which does it. Uh, it's led to huge increases in diversity for both groups. So on the insect side, um, arthropods are the largest group. Uh, insects are the largest group within arthropods, about 90%. <laughs> Um, and so the angiosperms, also the flowering plants that co evolved with insects, also saw this explosion in diversity. So both groups have, have benefited from this relationship. Um, just to give you an idea of when, in, in deep evolutionary time, when this happened, uh, here is about where, down here in the early Devonian, is where insects first uh, emerged. Um, it was right after the first land plant, insects followed quickly. Um, and then you get these flowering plants that are around here. Um, and then almost immediately you have bees. And the bees that were in existence way back then have not changed that very much from that point. So uh, this, this relationship is a really deep, old relationship between pollinators and plants. So onto the bees, onto the, what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, there are thousands of native species. So there are about 4,000 native species in the United States, and that's just how many we know. Um, they don't all look like bees that we think about. We think usually about a bumblebee or a honeybee. Um, not all native bee species have that distinctive look, uh, but there are probably around 1,000 in Texas, let's say, thousands and thousands of native bee species worldwide. And then we have this really major non-native species, which is ivy. Um, so I get asked a lot. People know about declines in honeybees. Are honeybees endangered? Well, in the U.S., they really can't be because they're not a native species to begin with. We imported them. Um, we don't call them invasive because they do a lot of service for us, and they don't tend to displace a lot of other things. Um, but they are definitely not from here. They're from, well, their relatives are more from Asia. Um, the European honeybee is North Africa, Europe. That, that area. They're really highly specialized, so all those pollinators, I showed you, you know, flies, beetles, and, and butterflies and moths, they're the most, uh, the most specialized for pollination. And that's mainly because they use pollen as a food source for their larva. Or, so when they're raising brood, pollen is a food source, whereas nectar is kind of the sugar that they run off, the energy source. Um, they've got these really specialized tongues for nectar collection, um, like this honeybee here that's drinking a little bit of honey, um, you know, definite sweet cheese. This whole area here was formed from mouth parts that, that look totally different from this and other insects, but they've been modified to form a, a tongue to, to get nectar. And the honeybee that tongue is about a quarter of inch, depends on the exact type. Um, they have branch hairs for pollen, covering their entire body. Um, and this is the same for native bees. Uh, in the honeybee, they actually have hairs even between the facets of their eyes here, and I'll show you pictures that way. So pollen sticks to them. Um, even as they fly, they create sort of a static charge to fly through the air, much as if you're walking across carpet and socks, scrubbing your wheels, you'll get a little bit of a static charge. So as honeybees fly, they have this static charge in the humerus. They land on a flower um, and pick up a lot of pollen, even if they're just there for nectar. And more pollen carrying features that vary between honeybees and the other native bees. Um, here's an example of a bumblebee. You can see it's got a pollen carrying structure right here, the pollen basket or curriculum, um, and that one's full of pollen. Um, there are some native bees that have what's called a scopa, which is just a pollen carrying apparatus with dense hairs on the bottom of their abdomen, but really highly specialized for carrying pollen from plant to plant. And back to the hives in this. There's some definite differences between honeybees and the large group that are, we'll just call native bees. Um, as I said, honeybees are not native. Native bees, oh, well, they are. Um, native bees also, if you have a plant, such as a vegetable plant, that originated in the Americas, they sometimes handle those more efficiently than honeybees do. Um, the nice thing about honeybees is. They overwinter in these really large numbers. So right now, when nothing else is out there and active, we have honeybees, and if it warms up over 60, they're ready to fly out of pollinate. Um, so that's an advantage to honeybees. Whereas native bees, 
every single native bee overwinters as a single individual. And then they have to build back up the next year. Honeybees probably get down and keep 10,000, 20,000 rings, but they're still pretty ready to go as soon as it, it warms up. Um, honeybees have a really complex social structure. They're all the way to what we call insocial, which is a very, it's the, the highest sort of form of social order between animals. Um, they have only one queen in the hive who does all of the female reproduction. 99% uh, of the bees are sterile female workers. And then you have, depending on time of year, you can have a few hundred to a few thousand girls, which are the male bees. Native bees, they vary in social structure from completely solitary to where they build up to that really high social level, like in bumblebees, but they always start out single. Honeybees are the most managed. That's the other uh, sort of benefit and why we use them so much is because you can call this box of bees to where the pollination will occur. And that's really important in our modern agriculture systems. Um, in native bees, there are a few managed species. Um, so in the US, we can buy packages of bumblebees, little micro colonies of bumblebees from um, farmers and patients. That's usually used more in greenhouse settings. Um, some, like alfalfa bees, which are the cutter bees, you can also purchase. But the vast majority are completely unmanaged, and we don't know nearly as much about them. Here's just an example of the diversity of native bees. This is actually from California, but Texas would look fairly similar in that there's a wide variety of look to a native bee. Um, the size of native bees varies times as well. So, as far as as their habits and how their social structure, um, the uniting kind of characteristic of native bees is there is no uniting characteristic. They're very variable. Uh, their social structures, like I said, could be solitary bees, um, all the way up to up to bumblebees at the end of the year before they, they kind of all fall to pieces, where you do have one one queen who's doing all the reproduction and, and uh, sterile application to worker catch better. Um, nesting. So when I talk about native bees later, this is very important. Um, nesting varies as well, whereas honeybees and bees we're, we're pretty familiar with beehives. Um, but in native bees you have different categories. So you have bees that actively go dig a hole either in the ground or in sort of uh, more porous or picky um, stems, twigs, leaves, that kind of thing. There's a, there's a European uh, bee, native bee that is bird in the ground. Um, hole nesters, this is where your bumblebees fall. And most people don't know much about how bumblebees actually live out in the field, but um, what happens with hole nesters is they find an existing hole and they take over that hole. So if you have holes in logs that were caused by woodborne beetles there, then um, some native bees would use those actually quite a few. Uh, bumblebees are interesting in that they usually, they're not very good at digging their own nest. And so they'll usually find an old like mouse burrow um, and use that as their nest. This is an example of the leaf cutter bee. So they use those existing holes so you can purchase these little things sometimes at the local beach or their um, a leaf cutter bee who is trying to encourage leaf cutter bees to nest there. So these reeds are obtained. Um, have holes that are existing that are yeah, pretty attractive to the cutter bees. They don't mind nesting near each other in the solitary. And then you got carpenters, which some of some of you may have experienced in the past. Carpenters actively um, excavate their own burrows and in solid wood, um, they tend to look like this picture where you you got them going against the grain for maybe there's your show and then you go with the grain and happy people. These little chambers where they have their, their babies. As far as communication and the resources they use, um, communication is not nearly as advanced as we'll talk about later in honeybees. Communication, things like bumblebees, which are pretty advanced socially for these natives. Um, bumblebees will come back and communicate if they found something, really good food source, but they don't tell the other bees where. Um, they pretty much just have to smell it on them and go search for that source. 
say a, a really nice blooming flower that's producing a lot of nectar. Um, whereas honeybees can, can give a lot of information in their communication. Uh, plants visited show plants visited varies. There's definitely overlap. Uh, there are rare bees that just visit one species of plant. Um, most of the time, the plant themselves has several species of bees that visit it. Or they've got a little more a little more buffer involved. Um, so there's overlap between these species on the plants they visit, uh, but there are some things that divide them as well. So things like tongue leaf, that shows you the honeybee tongue is about a quarter of an inch. Um, tongue leaf definitely affects what can be used most efficiently. So if you have a flower with a really long corolla, um, there are small bees with shorter tongues that just can't reach the nectar. Um, but if you have very shallow nectaries, um, it may actually be a disadvantage to have a very long tongue. It's just, it's just too much to to efficiently get to all of the uh, methods. Adaptations that are for specializations, and I'll talk about next. Um, and then, as far as how many they visit, like I said, you can have some bees that really specialize in a specific group of plants, or even lower to just one species of plant. Uh, most of them are to, an, to a point generalist where they will visit multiple species. This is one of those examples. I forget this will be. Um, that name, but this is a bee, little small, very small little bee that only visits yellow passion flower. That's all. So it, it completes its entire life cycle using this plant um, pretty quickly and then waits until next year and then emerges to utilize yellow passion flower. Um, but yes, all, all of these bees, the native bees, begin in spring in really low numbers. So as a generally a native female, will start a new colony, if they start a colony, or they'll show it solitary. Um, this is a bumblebee nest that you have to see, a bumblebee nest before. So this was excavated, probably was an old rodent burrow. Um, you can see there aren't that many bees. Bumblebee nests can get up into the few hundreds at the most, and they always start out with just one new queen that is overwintered. And so they they have a lot of, of input they have to do at first before you can get the workforce to build a larger colony. Okay, on the honeybees, my real house. Um, so I was saying that bees have a lot of branch hairs. The honeybees even have hairs on their eyes themselves. As you can see in this picture, very good insect photographer. It's a good bee picture as well. Um, but you can see how much pollen can be collected with just the uh, just the hairs on the bee, not even with an active flesh and pollen. Um, the importance of honeybees, bees, bees have been in the news a lot recently, ever since about 2008, 2009. They've really seen an increase in popularity. Um, I call them imported, but important. I said, we know they're not native, but they become increasingly important, um, especially with our systems of agriculture. So there are some things, such as almonds, that are pollinated 100% by honeybees. None of the native bees can, can get to almonds. They bloom around late February. Um, and there are also thousands and thousands of acres of almonds. And so if you're a native bee, you cannot rely on something that blooms for two weeks and then becomes a vegetable. That's what an almond worker makes for the age. So honeybees, um, we actually, at this point, uh, transport on trucks to Northern California about 60% of the entire number of managed bees in the U.S. for almond pollination. So that's just an extreme example um, of how honeybees have become really important to our agricultural systems. Um, so we have high products. Everyone loves honey. Uh, we've got honey, beeswax. Um, people even tend to use pollen, propolis, other variety of, of products from honey hives. Um, but the food supply is really the important part. The pollination services that, they, that honeybees provide. Um, about a third of the U.S. food supply is dependent on specifically honeybee pollination. So that's, I've heard people say that if bees die, honeybees die within two years of getting to such. That's not really true. Um, we, our diet would give a lot more bored. <laughs> we definitely take a hit. So things like um, corn, oats, wheat, those things are when pollinated, those things would still would still provide some food and those are tend to be less staples, but a lot of 
who would go away. Um, about 15, and actually that number based on, on sort of more recent government reports may have increased to about 17 billion. But over 15 billion dollars was added to the U.S. economy uh, by pollination services by Honey Beach. Um, they're really interested in the study and it says they have this high, high form of social order uh, where you've got um, one queen, here's a queen right in the middle. Um, she's the only one that lays eggs. She's the one that, that has, these are all her daughters. Um, you have really complex communication. So they use chemical cues, pheromones. Um, they also use visual cues, uh, referential dance. Really, really interesting forms of communication. So when honeybees is a forage and bee finds a good flower source. She comes back to the hive, performs a dance that tells her nest mates not only how good the flower source is, um, but the direction it is and how far you have to fly to get there. So they can become really, really efficient at finding flowers. And declines have also been in the news. So um, declines in honeybees are really a big conglomeration of problems that they're facing all at once. If you've heard the term colony collapse, that was around that 2009-2010, this became a really popular term. Um, in the literature, if you're in honeybees, colony collapse disorder is a very specific kind of syndrome that we didn't understand where people were losing bees over the winter and they were losing them in really specific ways. Um, in pop culture, however, colony collapse just means decline in honeybees. And I'm really pretty okay with that definition at this point because we are experiencing overall declines. If you're a beekeeper, um, you, you lose more hives in the winter than you used to by far. Um, you have to work much harder to replace those. Luckily you can, but we're kind of, we're kind of running this race that's getting faster and faster about trying to, trying to replace hives that you've lost. Um, and so the hives might not even be quite as high quality at the same time of year because you're having to split hives create new queens, and on and on. So it's being much harder to be a beekeeper. Um, and there's a lot of demand for bees. Like I said, in almonds, they have to have them. Um, a lot of people pay for pollination services. Uh, parasites and disease. This is a really big problem that honeybees are facing. Um, if you can see, such and bravely holding this honeybee, uh, this here is a varroa mite. That's one of the most major it is, it is the most major pest in the U.S. right now, kind of use. Um, a lot of the pests are fairly recent in production. This one is 1985 that it, it came to the U.S. and now it is ubiquitous. If you have honeybees, you have varroa mite pests. Um, the other problem with varroa mites is that they vector diseases. So uh, they work much like a tick. They have these mouth parts, they, they suck the bee blood. Um, and they vector diseases, sort of like a little dirty hypodermic needle going from the bee. Overall stress, so especially in commercial beekeeping operations, this has been pointed out as an immediate problem that we're, I mean, we're hauling these bees from Texas to Northern California. You know, that is a very stressful sort of a lifestyle. They're there pollinating pretty frantically, then they're boxed back up again and hauled across the U.S. to like blueberries or apples. Um, so it's a different management system than we've had to use in the past. Um, pesticides, and I say plus. So pesticides are a problem in kind of use. They're exposed to a lot of different plants that have pesticides applied to them. Um, I say plus because even things like uh, herbicides and fungicides that hypothetically do not affect bees, there's evidence that sometimes when you mix them with Sides or other things, they, they possibly could in some cases. Um, and they definitely transport them back to the hive where they show up in lab samples and method samples. And available sources of nutrition. So our landscape is greatly modified. <laughs> um, honeybees sometimes have a hard time finding food, and more often, even than that, they have a hard time finding diverse food. Um, so they get all their protein from pollen. Not all pollen is created equal. I kind of tell people, uh, in the case of almonds, so when you transport bees to almonds, they only have almonds. <laughs> um, and so even if it's a very nutritionally 
a good pollen that you're collecting for almonds. That's all they have. And so if you eat broccoli, it's healthy, but if you eat broccoli 100% of the time, you develop some issues. So they're underlying all this, they're facing nutrition problems. And I bolded these two because as a person growing vegetables um, or other crops, you, you really can affect these two problems in honeybees. This is Marla Stivak, she's at the University of Minnesota. She, she does a lot on um, honeybee nutrition. Um, if you get a chance, she's got an older but very good TED talk actually on this topic. So I said I would talk a little bit about specializations that pollinators, especially bees, honeybees, and native bees, um, experience with plants. So, sonication. Um, sonication is a thing that honeybees do not do. For one, uh, this is what we call buzz pollination, is a more common term. Some plants, the way that their anthers are, um, they don't open, they have a little pore at the tip. Um, pollen is not readily accessible. So, what has to happen, and this is pretty common in many members of the Solanaceae, such as tomatoes, would be the most common example, um, is that bee, that's why honey bees won't do it, um, but Native bees like bumblebees have to come up, grab onto the flower, and vibrate their wing muscles um, to the point which that pollen falls out. So this is this is a bumblebee doing buzz pollination. But yeah, the pollen is kind of tightly held; it's not just exposed to the world. Um, so the bumblebee has to vibrate it out at a very specific frequency. Um, another specialization, like I said, how these are these bees partition the flower resources that they use. Um, I was trying to, I briefly mentioned this earlier, um, but for example, this tiny little sweat bee here, um, even though the tiny length is, is pretty decent for its size, it's just not going to cut it if it gets in touch with the flower with a really deep corolla. Um, whereas this bumblebee has a tiny that's, you know, getting up to that third of an inch, half inch range almost sometimes, depending on their body size. And so they can kind of partition out. But if the if the bumblebee went to a flower like this little deposit flower where everything's very very kind of short distances, um, they're actually not nearly as efficient as the small bees. And so that's how there there are these groupings based on something. Um, another really kind of interesting one to me, and you don't really get it in vegetables, but but uh, a lot of people are familiar with alfalfa for forage. You get it in that um, are tripping mechanisms and access issues. So these are mechanisms that plants have developed um, to be efficiently pollinated, pretty much. But they often limit some bee visits. So there will be bees that can use them, and there will be bees that cannot. Um, alfalfa, honeybees don't pollinate it well. Um, it has a tripping mechanism that I'll show you in a minute. Um, but there's a little leaf cutter bee that we import for alfalfa pollination. So this is not alfalfa, but it's a, a bigger example of the same sort of tripping mechanism. Um, pretty much when a bee lands on this, this stuff room flower, um, if it is the correct bee, in this case it's probably more weight, uh, the anthers spring up and pretty much hit the bee, um, deposit a lot of pollen on them. Um, honeybees cannot do this in alfalfa. So honeybees tend to kind of like through the side, they're kind of get to the nest through the side, and they're not really as efficient at pollen um, as, as things like our alfalfa bees and leaf cutter I was talking about. Another, another access specialization is things like trap dragons, I think, um, <laughs> for this picture. So they have these petals that are pretty much are fused and must be pushed down for the bee to access the pollen and nectar. Um, so this bumblebee was just heavy enough to push these petals down, but a lot of bees aren't. I've actually seen honeybees get into a snap dragon and they get a little cold and not quite be able to push their way back out. Here's an example of what the flower does not want and why a lot of these specializations occur. Um, this is a stretch of uh, sometime around October, and it's a very large carpenter bee in a long tube but narrow flower where it's just bypassing what the flower wants in pollination, going biting through the base and going straight to the nectar switch. 
um, in a payoff for their pollination services. And like I said, uh, bees receive a lot of things because they receive nectar. So that is only because the flower wants to be visited by a pollinator that they can reach out. Nectar, I said that's the, the fuel, the sugar source, the carbohydrates. Um, pollen, pollen is more protein source for the developing group. Adult bees use pollen to a point, but it's mainly a, an immature bee food source. Um, also, some lipids that in pollen. That's an example of good diverse pollen over here. I think this is collected from California. And you can see these are actually knocked off of the legs of honeybees as they move into their hive um, with, a, with a pollen trap. Um, and so this was the diversity of pollen that bees are bringing in. You can see just from, from the color how many different sources that's coming from. And that's the ideal situation. If you were coming in from almonds, it would all be the exact same. Um, propolis. Propolis, how many people know about? You see it sometimes in the you know, like specialty and health food stores. Um, propolis is really plant resins that have been modified just a little bit by the bees. Um, in honeybees, they use these to pretty much glue things together and seal things. So if you have a small crack in their hive, they will seal it with propolis. Um, it's the bane of the beekeeper's existence sometimes because you have to pry everything apart to be sealed with these resins. So that bee is actually collected, sap, and put it on their pollen basket, which is very difficult for them to unload. And characteristics of bee plants before you get straight into the vegetables. Um, they can be native or not native plants. So native plants are definitely better for native bees. And native bees tend to be really efficient on native plants because they have this relationship a while, right? Um, but non-native plants uh, do serve as, as, as resources for bees, and especially honey bees. Um, there's no accounting for taste in honey bees, no pollinate. Is it really terrible invasives and natives and everything? Um, natives overall require less maintenance, less pesticide use, and that is very good for bees overall. Um, bees see white, yellow, blue, and UV light, but they actually do not see much red. So their vision is just shifted a little bit from ours, and you can see in here, and kind of stop here. Bees go into these shorter and UV or ultraviolet places. And that, that means kind of interesting things for their vision. As you can see, like I said, most of the red has kind of dropped off the scale. Um, because they're shifted into the UV, a lot of flowers have these things called nectar dyes to lure bees in and pretty much point bees to where they want to be to visit. Which is some examples of nectar dyes that I think are kind of interesting. Usually we can't see them um, with our visual spectrum. This is, as an exception, this is, um, oh, lost the name. But anyway, it has visible, oh, it's a flash flood, there you go. Um, it has visible nectar dives that, that even our students can see. Um, but down here on the far right, the bottom right, this is just a normal, usually people consider it a pest, dandelion. Um, and so this is the visible light that you put a filter on. You can see that it has this area is first drawing bees to the center. Um, so bees can get not only a better search image when they're out looking for flowers, um, but they can be kind of lured right to where the plant wants them to collect nectar uh, so that they'll pollinate those plants. Um, for vegetables and fruit, I'll try to keep it mainly vegetable, but then there's a lot of fruit pollination also that happens via yeah, bees. Um, when you have Incomplete pollination. When you have something that is dependent upon pollination by an insect, especially bees, um, you get some really, really unfortunate <laughs> results. Uh, your product, be it a fruit or vegetable, tends to be smaller um, and is often misshapen, sometimes extremely. Um, so here in bell peppers, especially the bell pepper on the left, the red one, um, you can see for one, it has very few seeds. So that's one indicator that it wasn't well pollinated. So these seeds were pollinated, that's pretty much it. Um, because of this, it grew sort of an odd shaped fruit that's not very marketable. Both of those peppers are very small. Um, here's an extreme example of strawberries. 
In strawberry, you can actually see which seeds were pollinated. So a lot of these fruits and vegetables where they have quite a few trees, especially, um, you can tell if they had poor pollination because the seeds that were pollinated in such strawberries are larger and they have a lot more fruit around them. Um, and there are some tiny little seeds that just were, did not get pollinated. Um, the need does vary by the plant. Oh, another good example is um, in, in apples and pears. If they're not pollinated well, fruit tends to be a little skewed, just asymmetric. Um, but it depends on the plant whether this is a totally dependent process. Some plants must be cross pollinated. Um, some plants are just better production if they're pollinated. You get a little bit larger of a fruit or vegetable, or just a little bit better of a product overall, more yield. Um, and then there are plants that are fully self fertile, that are, don't need pollination, like these or anything else. Um, sometimes you uh, However, the self fertile varieties don't think that bees won't visit them. <laughs> it means that bees don't need you, but if you spray the pesticides on that, um, that self fertile plant, sometimes you can still get bees visiting inside. From that application. So I'm going to go into a few big groups um, that I can say general things about. <laughs> They're not always just examples here and there that, that I haven't covered, but I'll try to make sure to talk about a little bit. Um, the cucurbit, the cucurbitaceae family. Um, these are pretty common plants the cucumbers, squash, pumpkins, and little two melons. Um, these plants completely require pollination. If you do not have insect pollination, you have to hand pollinate, which is not always so fun, especially in cucumbers. Um, the reason for this is that the flowers on the same plant are either male or female. They're not both. They're, they're incomplete flowers. Um, also called dioecious. So, so that pollen has to be transferred from that male flower to that female flower. And the pollen is actually pretty heavy, pretty sticky. It doesn't go well by wind. Um, and so you really have to have pollinators visit. The base of honeybee, it takes something like 15 visits to a female flower for good fruit set. Um, you'll see this in the cucurbits when they get poorly pollinated is they will be smaller and misshapen, um, just not right. There is a native specialist. Honeybees are great because there are a lot of honeybees, and so maybe you can get those 15 visits to that female flower to get your good summer spots. Um, however, there are many specialists that if you have are really nice uh, and efficient. Um, there's a squash bees, which is a general term. Um, like I said, honeybees can pollinate these cucurbits, but they're a lot less efficient than these, these couple of genera of native bees, or squash bees. Um, squash bees, they're out earlier when these cucurbits are blooming, um, and they're actually modified, even the, the spacing of the hairs is correct for the collection of this really big pollen brand that the cucurbits produce. Um, so they're really efficient. They don't need nearly as many visits to a flower to fully pollinate it. Um, they just cool off better, basically, to these cucurbits, which are sort of a, a native of the Americas, so it makes sense. Um, you know, we can know the exact genera of the Epimacus and Cedar are the, the two Different squash bees, we see a lot of pepination. And pepinatus uh, brunosa, which is this, this picture down here. Um, Venus also looks similar. They're about the size of honeybees. They look a little bit different if you're pretty versed. They don't have the striking as much on the back of them. A little bit different look to them, but not a whole lot. Um, here is Venus also down here. Definitely not bees. These are your Western plug rootworm. You don't, you don't want those. Um, <laughs> but this is just a good example of don't spray that flower for bees while they're still drinking. <laughs> um, there, there's a beneficial there along with the pest species. Um, and squash bees are actually a good example of why that you can encourage around your tea service or you can totally decimate their population. They tend to nest in the ground, they nest near. The plants themselves, so if you have quite a few um, shade, uh, summer squash or something, um, or pumpkins, you will have these nesting in the ground near them. You can easily disturb them or kill them um, and not catch across these pollinators. 
Yeah. So in AC, um, nightshade family, the one that which is like tomatoes, we touched on buzz pollination earlier. Um, most of these examples can self-pollinate. A little bit of wind will pollinate most of them. Um, but they tend to do a little bit better, have a little bit bigger of a fruit if they are pollinated. So if they are visited by native bees, they can do that buzz pollination. Um, they'll produce a little bit nicer, larger fruit. Uh, but wind does play a role. Um, common species that are buzz pollinated, it's not 100% of this family, but it is quite a few, so tomatoes, a lot of the peppers, potatoes, eggplants, those are all buzz pollinated, so not reliant on honeybees, but really reliant on those native bees, which you can see um, a, a higher yield if you just have a lot of native bees in the area. This is the anthers of the buzz pollinated plants that I was talking about earlier. Instead of just splitting open and having pollen available all down the anther, you just have this little core at the end, so when they and it does pollinate, the bee does um, you vibrate it just, just correctly, pollen comes out. Uh, pretty, pretty dramatic connection. <laughs> I won't show you this video now, but there's a video if you want to look at it later. I'm um, someone using a tuning fork at the right frequency um, and stimulating those anthers, and lots of pollen comes out when you do it correctly. Um, bumblebees are often used for tomatoes in the greenhouse, which I wanted to. To mention that, in part, so you have to even still air in greenhouses. So while tomatoes do self-pollinate, um, there's not as much wind to even short shake some pollen loose. So in greenhouses, they're very still air. Um, and so people will, pretty much anyone that's selling a lot of tomatoes um, and doing it in, in greenhouses and hoop houses will use managed bumblebees to pollinate those better, get it just a better, larger tomato. Um, another very broad category is the root and leaf vegetables. So I put quite a few in here. They don't all belong to one family. They're a little bit all over the place. But these are the vegetables that you're not really produce. You're not really consuming um, the fruit or, or the, the fruit produced by the plant. And so you don't need pollination if you're just wanting that consumable part. Um, if you're needing seed, however, you still do a lot of the time. Um, so things like Cabbages, a lot of the grass you see uh, where you're, you're eating the leaves, for example. Uh, things where you're eating the roots, uh, such as radishes, onions, or carrots. Uh, these are things that pollinators will visit and are more or less dependent on plant pollinators. Uh, however, you don't really need, need that for the consumable part of the plant. Um, this is someone that's let their, I guess their onions and, and turnips maybe go to seed. Um, and pollinators actually love them. It's a great source of nutrition, great resource. Um, before I go on to pesticides, I want to mention again uh, the wind pollinated crops, things like corn. Um, corn is visited by bees, even though they don't really need bees to pollinate. And so if you're thinking, well, you know, I can use these coated seed treatments and use corn and it doesn't affect anything. Well, it, it sure does. Uh, because bees, especially if they don't have a good resource elsewhere, will visit things to collect pollen, even even if the plant is wind pollinated. Um, another another good example of a vegetable that can use pollination but doesn't really fit into this category is okra. Um, <laughs> you get mixed <laughs> mixed reviews on pollination of okra because people see seed, they often don't want it crossing with other varieties, but okra. Um, but similar to cotton, which is in the same family, does do a little bit better, a little bit better of a, of a product if it's pollinated by the general regularly. So. On the pesticides, so overall, um, pesticides are going to be more harmful to your beneficial insects than they are to the pest. That's pretty much across the board. Uh, it's, a, it's an unfortunate thing. Um, but what happens is pest insects have been have been evolving in this arms race with plants for a long time. They're used to chemicals and things being thrown at them by the plant so that the plant avoids them feeding them. And then they're used to adapting to that. Um, pollinators and other beneficial insects like predators and parasitoids, 
they don't have that mechanism in place. They've never had to escape that, that chemical warfare that French kind of poached. Um, and for that reason, they're not very good at detoxifying a lot of these pesticides. Uh, they don't really develop any resistance to the pesticide like the pesticide. So across the board, um, pesticides are very toxic to eat and other than this one fish. So my recommendations for that is that your garden vegetables doesn't matter, just avoid them if possible. If you don't need to spray pesticides, don't. Um, read the labels. We're actually in the process of developing uh, labeling for pollinated in Texas. That should be out. Not much of the machine that has to be finished this year. That's where it takes the shell, so to speak. Um, but read labels and, and apply to label directions. Um, and then lastly, and this is pretty simple, if you have to apply pesticides, try to apply them to avoid leaks. Uh, seems basic, but people don't think about this a lot. And that's my stepfather is a great example. He had apple seeds that did not set any fruit because he applied a pesticide or a pest insect during the bloom period. He killed every day that he could do it. They didn't get a chance to even visit another flower before he died. Um, so just avoiding the time of, of that plant uh, cycle where it's blooming will avoid killing a lot of bees if you have to apply pesticides. I have an important caveat to that next, but <laughs> Um, time of day, also this depends if it's more a honeybee thing. Few honeybees are out very early or very late, so if you must apply around blue, if you apply your pesticide closer to sunset, you're not likely to get most of bees. Native bees are very different in that, however, so you're still going to kill some of the bees, even if that dissipates by morning, so how you use back out. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about neonicotinoids because they're a very big thing in the beach. Um, neonicotinoids, this is a new class of insecticide. And I say new, uh, they, they sort of began, I think the first one was in the 1990s, in the um, It's a new type, which is nice because things aren't resistant to it yet. That's likely to happen. It's pretty widely used, so in the US, Crops, which has actually been banned in Europe for a lot of crop research. Um, but if you notice, there's Home Depot shelf. <laughs> Not to them specifically, but I haven't vetted exactly every one of these, but pretty much every one is a new nicotinoid. Um, so new nicotinoids are widely available for public use um, and for landowner use. So, um, and they're actually used sometimes at concentrations well above what we see in crop situations. So if someone's planting a cornfield, they're the ones we tend to think about, oh, they're killing the bees, well, because they have feed treatments that these new nicotinoids in all the corn now. Um, but they're actually applying at lower levels than we're using in our own backyards, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there's a lot of different methods that new nicotinoids are applied. Um, the, the way they work is actually it's pretty safe for vertebrates, which is nice. Um, but they, they work in the insect nervous system. Um, and they're really specific to insects. So they're not very toxic for us. It's great, but they're very toxic to insects, including bees. In fact, some of the original work on the nicotinoids used bee tissues <laughs> as an example. Not to say that it was bad for bees, but just to show that it had insecticidal activity. Um, but yeah, there are a variety of ways to use you can just use foliar sprays. Uh, seed coatings, like I said, pretty much all the corn out there has a big spot on the box. Um, soil drenches, <laughs> which is a little bit terrifying. Uh, we also put it in irrigation water sometimes. So these neonicotinoids, the really important thing to understand about them is that they are systemic. So regardless of how you use that product, it goes into the plant. It gets picked up by the vascular system. It goes throughout the plant. If you're combating something like a corn rootworm, that's great because you can actually get to the roots of the plant under the dirt, right? Um, if you're a pollinator, that's not good <laughs> because that means that there's insecticides expressed in the pollen, expressed in the nectar. Um, and plants do this differently. They do break this down over time, but sometimes it's have a resurgence, 
there's generally always a low level of this pesticide uh, that's being picked up by bees if they've been treated. Um, sometimes it gets to really low levels, but sometimes it's quite high to where you have like or just immediate death of these fishes. A good example of that would be that they target bee kill that is all over the news. I don't know if y'all have heard about it, but it, in 2013, um, we're at around the target of Nancy, which is at the Pacific Northwest. They were sprayed with one of the new cures, so foliar spray, and the next day they had thousands and thousands of dead bees. <laughs> um, so that, that's an example of something to avoid. Um, but regardless of how it's applied, like I said, it's expressed throughout the plant, it can actually maybe even seep into nearby plants if it's in the soil, so a seed coating. Um, they have some evidence that so field edges may have some unit uh, expression as well with the soil and these other plants as well. So it is an issue with bees. Um, but regardless of of if they're maybe a little worse because they're systemic insecticides, just insecticides are toxic to bees. It doesn't really matter what they are, they pretty much are. Um, Neonics are just a problem, like I said, because they are definitely in the, the products that bees collect, bring back to the hive, and also with their, their brood with. It doesn't even necessarily have to kill the bee at the time, but uh, chronic exposure is, is led to some learning and memory findings that are a little bit disturbing. Um, on the habitat, so if you want to encourage pollinators to come to what you're planting, allowing some naturalized areas for nests to be built is great. So in honeybees, uh, you can have feral populations that come in, and you can also bring in honeybees yourself, so they're kind of a known quantity. Um, with native bees, they're free, which is nice, um, and if you provide them places to nest, you will often get them. Uh, so on fence lines and field edges, if you just establish sort of these no mow zones um, and allow some naturalization there, you can get nesting areas and resources for these bees. Um, fallow areas are great places to kind of let naturalize and for for nesting and for for resources once again. Um, not having all the ground cultivated, cultivated ground is nice when bees are establishing a nest, but then if you go and run through it again, obviously you're destroying the nest if they're a ground nesting bee. And also just to plant or conserve diversity, or both, actually both. Um, because bees need resources more of the year than just a short period of time, uh, diverse plants provide nectar and pollen for a good part of the year, um, rather than just having kind of a boom and bust economy of, okay, well, two weeks from this crop is moving. Another dirt. Um, so conserving and planting diversity of, of plants is, is very important. Um, but it also attracts many of the honeybees to the area. So not only are you helping the ones that are established there, but they're also flying in from elsewhere if you've got a bit of diversity and, and blooms for each region. But it just provides a more stable nutrition source for all those species, honeybees and bees. Kind of wrapping things up, but just to show you, um, this is an older example, but what we don't want to do in our vegetables and fruits. <laughs> so, Asia periodically and kind of long term now has experienced some bee shortages, uh, much worse than the Americas. Um, so, this is how they resorted to pollination of fruits, which is very dependent on honeybees. Um, we don't want to get to that point. There are some people that do hand pollinate, but normally here it's just if you want to keep your, uh, your varieties. Breathing food if you're running to feed that kind of thing, if you have indoor plants or greenhouse plants. So, we're avoiding this situation. Um, now, I'll give you some sources for more information. If anyone has any questions, I can take them now and I can show you our lab website if you want any more information from us. We have a Honeybee Lab website and also a Facebook page, and a lot of people have liked and we end up posting quite a bit on that. Um, with that, I will. Questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, well, um, very nice presentation. Uh, any anybody has a question? You can type it in the chat or ask it out. Mm. 
don't forget to fill in the evaluation forms and email them directly to Paul Pope. Okay, we have a question. Can you Almost. <laughs> Why do honeybees hover around our hummingbird feeders? We we have this a lot. Um, so honeybees are out there frantically collecting nectar whenever possible. Uh, that's just that's just how they do. But um, a lot of times we'll experience times when there just isn't a lot of nectar available out in the out in the environment, and honeybees are out looking for it. Anyway. And so you've provided a great sugar source for honeybees. Um, <laughs> and once the first bee finds it, they go back and tell all their nestmates. So within an hour, even, you'll have this huge increase in bees. Um, you'll also see that around like, like uh, baseball fields where you have a lot of soda, you know, anywhere with, uh, with bleachers when you have people drinking sugary drinks. Um, in fact, we feed honeybees sugar water. And so you just you've provided them an amazing source. <laughs> now, as far as discouraging them, once they find it, it's real hard to do. So, but yeah, that's a, that's a good question. They will they will visit anything sweet. Um, they'll even eat, go out and eat honeydew. Um, honeybee, they're kept near like M M&M factories. They found that the honey should be multicolored. <laughs> so, well, that's the answer to that. Is that you just you're feeding bees, you just shouldn't know it. Okay. Thank you. And there's a question of um, from Brazoria County. How does one encourage squash bee habitation or habitat for, I guess, for? Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much, well, one thing to avoid, so they're a, a bee that's, that's digging a hole in the ground and actually pretty near their resources. So if you've got enough uh, enough of these plants that they pollinate, you are attracting them to the area more than likely. Um, but keeping things like um, you know the herb the herb or the uh, weed resistant cloth, um, putting that down will basically negate any squash seeds that's in there. Um, so having just a naturalized area where you're not turning the ground up a lot nearby that's helpful. Um, other than that, just having having a, enough of these plants that they pollinate will bring them to the area. It depends on where you are. Sometimes it can take a little while um, if you've not got them flowing in from other areas. Uh, but if you've got a lot of kind of more natural um, area around you, you know, a lot of concrete city, it's a lot easier. So just just trying to avoid turning up all of the dirt in the area with the plants and squash and whatnot. Thank you. And another question is, do bees that pollinate poison ivy transfer those chemicals to the honey? <laughs> I, you know, that's a good question. I've never experienced it. Um, bees will visit those and they'll, you know, they are flowers that are occasionally visited. I would say that at least it's, it's never to the point where I've noticed it. <laughs> um, they don't collect so much off of those that you have just honey that was strictly from poison ivy. Uh, however, I got a beekeeper question not that long ago um, where they had honey that kind of had a jalapeno pit to it almost, like they said it made their throat kind of scratchy and their lips tingle. Um, and it was a plant source. So sometimes, sometimes plants, uh, if the same type properties do show up as honey under the taste, and this was snow on the prairie, which is poisonous to livestock, but it has, has just enough of certain compounds to, to make it a little off-putting, so we say. But yeah, I don't think poison ivy is ever a problem. It's interesting in an area where they had a whole lot of poison ivy on the shelf, but I, I've never experienced that myself. Okay, and the last question, 
Are you concerned about 2,4-D glyphosate-resistant crops and the increase of spraying that might result? Will that affect bees? Is this being studied? Yeah, so I'm not as aware of 2,4-D specifically, but I know that there are a lot of studies that are showing that regardless of what is what happens when these chemicals are, are ingested by the bee, they are bringing it back. Um, so even things like Roundup are being brought back. Now, 2,4-D, I mean, I'm aware of what that looks like when you spray. Um, a lot of the, the crops are being sprayed along with herbicides. Uh, a side effect that, that is a real problem for bees, even if they don't um, have a lot of toxicity, the 2,4-D is not highly toxic to bees. I kind of have to look into that specific one. Um, but you kill a lot of the weeds around the edges, so you have to drift sometimes, right? Um, you kill a lot of those field as weeds that are important resources for the bees. <laughs> and so even even not in the case of G4D, but in the case of these Roundup Ready crops, what happened is we spray herbicides or the, the, all the time. <laughs> and so we, we get rid of a lot of the resources that previously were there on the edges of fields that bees use. It is, it is definitely an issue that I would like to I'd like to know more about G4G. A lot of times those compounds, they're either not indicated as toxic or only when another thing is mixed in or they become toxic. So. All right, last question from Brazoria County. Do GMO crops affect honey pollination? Um. A lot of the GMOs are in things that don't need to be pollinated by honeybees. GMOs don't seem to have a negative effect um, when pollen is, and nectar is collected from those plants on honeybees. Um, that kind of comes back to that herbicide thing, though. I think that's where GMOs have a little bit negatively affected honeybees, is where you have herbicide resistant crops and you're spraying these, these fields all the time. Um, so GMOs in that way have just reduced the, the diversity of we'll call them weeds <laughs> near the edges of those fields quite a lot. But they themselves are pretty pretty safe for the bees that are making um, cotton is a, is a big thing that we have and um, said corn, they'll visit, they'll collect that pollen. Um, they are more specific than the systemic pesticides. So uh, things like sometimes they'll only kill the lepidopter, butterflies, and moths. Um, that was why you was concerned with the monarchs with some of these GMO crops. But honeybees at least don't have that direct toxic effect, but they do they do see a reduction in their other resources sometimes because of these. Good question. Excellent. Thank you very much, Lauren. Appreciate it. With that, I thank you again and wish everybody Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Bye.